This is Deviance Lecture 3.1, Organizational Deviance. In this lecture, we're going to define white collar crime. We will then talk about corporate deviance and occupational deviance. If you are someone who just does not like politics, we are gonna be talking a little bit about politics in terms of content warnings. So let's start off with what exactly is white collar crime? What do we mean by that thing? Edwin Sutherland, who lived from 1883 to 1950, pioneered the study of white collar crime. Uh, he was one of the very first to start studying white collar crime in the 1940s. And at that time, white collar workers were not as prevalent as they are today, but in the 40s, it, they were very much a new type of worker. Sutherland observed that white collar crime is committed by the upper white collar class, which is composed of respectable or at least respected business and professional men. Uh, the idea there being when we are talking about white collar crime, we are talking about crimes done by people who e are either in business or of the upper classes. White collar crime takes advantage of certain flaws in our society. Uh, one of those flaws being that we live in what's called an asymmetric society. Definition of that being a society in which power of the ordinary person is far outstripped by other entities or maybe even other people. If somebody's a billionaire, they have a heck of a lot more power and say in society than you do and as do corporations, etc. To fold into that, there's another phenomenon called the shield of elitist visibility in which the belief that the rich and powerful cannot possibly commit crime or that crime that they commit is somehow less bad. Uh, this is a major component of what Sutherland observed in white collar crime that when we see celebrities commit a crime, we don't think it's that big of a deal, but if our neighbor would commit a crime, then we'd make a big deal out of it. That's, that's what that looks like in real life. Both of these phenomena conceal crimes of the powerful and highlight the needs uh, and highlights the crime of the powerless. So when somebody, uh, a lower class person commits a crime, they're far more likely to be punished than if, if an upper class person commits a crime. What makes white collar crime so different? Well, white collar criminals use power influence or respectability to minimize their detection. Think about what it means for somebody to be suspicious. You are probably thinking of somebody who is poor or at least not rich. And to fold into it, if we were to survey uh, large portions of the population, I'm sure race and ethnicity components would also come into place. And as a matter of fact, I'm certain of it. Uh, we, um, what another thing that makes white collar different, crime different is uh, that it is done in the name of maximizing profits. Uh, that uh, obviously if you're gonna commit a crime, you wanna get as much money out of the crime as you're going to, but that folds in very well with our capitalist economic system. So uh, the, the goals of capitalism can often be the goals of crime. And so that kind of has an effect of masking uh, the criminal behavior. Uh, Non-criminal self-image, uh, those who commit white collar crime usually don't think of themselves even as crime. There is unwitting cooperation on behalf of the victims. Uh, victims may cooperate with the white collar crime taking place by filling out a form that they're supposed to do or paying money to an account that they're supposed to pay. Little do they know that they're paying into this scheme that has been set up by someone within the company to funnel money out of the company. That's what that looks like. And also uh, to layer into all of this, when it comes to white collar crime, society is relatively indifferent. We just don't care as much about embezzling as we do about something that is sexier like uh, bank robbery, despite the fact that in terms of money stolen and overall damage to society, that embezzling of 
millions of dollars is far more damaging than the money that a bank robber would get away with. And typically bank robbers uh, usually get away with less than $10,000. So white collar crime can be divided into three broad categories. We have corporate deviance, occupational deviance, and governmental deviance. When I'm looking at these, I'm just going to mention that the thing that we most typically think of as white collar crime is probably best classified as occupational deviance and what that looks like. But these three categories are really good for breaking out what white collar crime is. So let's first look at corporate deviance. Corporate deviance is deviant behavior that directly benefits the company or individuals within the company. Uh, it's an important note that organizational deviance may be the better term because of deviance covered could also include nonprofit organizations. So you could, you, most people who do these crimes do it through corporations. And basically what they're doing here is helping the corporation make more money, right? This is not a crime that benefits an individual. It's a crime that benefits a company. Uh, with that said, hypothetically, you could structure a nonprofit to siphon money to help the nonprofit, but that's not really the, often the goals of the nonprofit. Nonprofits are often uh, lined up to be much more altruistic. So thus you wouldn't see as much uh, crime in that regard. Uh, like other types of deviance, corporate deviance is not always illegal. Uh, this is this is interesting. So uh, deviance here being uh, defined as something that it is uh, not regular, also something that is not uh, necessarily ethical. Things can be unethical and still be legal is another good way to put it. So moving corporate headquarters to avoid taxes. There are certain parts of this country and certain parts of the world that seem to be uh, explicitly set up to help corporations avoid paying taxes. Uh, the state of Delaware uh, in the United States has very, very low corp a corporate taxation rate. And for this reason, in the state of Delaware, you can find these massive uh, office building complexes where really big corporations are supposedly located and it might be effectively a closet with the name of a major corporation on the door. That is simply the bare minimum of what is required to have a corporate headquarters in Delaware and then to therefore not pay those taxes. Uh, the Cayman Islands, uh, I believe the Bahamas, uh, uh, there are other countries that do that as well. Another type of corporate deviance is overpaying executives. Um, this would be done, let's set, think of this uh, from an altruistic standpoint of while well, we need to help the corporation, they would overpay executives uh, to draw in more supposedly higher quality executives or this could be done with the executive doing it on purpose to kind of boost their salary uh, in the United States. I, I, I know this will come up in another lecture. Um, our CEOs typically make somewhere in the range of 250 times and th 400 times as much as the average employee. Definitely um, this kind of tweaking and overpaying executives is very common in our country. Stacking a board of directors uh, to serve a specific entity within the corporation. So hypothetically, a board of directors should be a more or less democratic unit, the, un, yeah, unit uh, that would um, allow multiple perspectives for running the corporation to happen, right? Well, one tactic that is used, you could call it um, inter-organizational uh, political, intra-organizational political, the politics that happen in the, the organization. Um, one way to get around that is basically to make everyone who is on your corporate board a ringer for your agenda, right? Make sure they, they do, are doing everything that you want them to do. And that is um, 
that's not illegal, but it's it's pretty clearly not ethical. And then giving money to candidates of both parties to ensure government favor and tax breaks. For example, oil companies often donate money to both the Democrats and Republicans at sort of equal rates. There may be a little more given to one than the other uh, because the, the one party may have uh, a better relationship with the entity, but uh, especially the massive corporations in the United States, they usually give both both to both parties. And the last point made on the slide, even though these are, um, they're pretty unethical things, uh, and even though they are not illegal, they, they do have a damaging effect on our society. So now let's move into this thing called occupational deviance. Occupational deviance is behavior that is done by a person with access to resources in their profession. Uh, it should be pointed out that most of the individual white collar criminals highlighted uh, earlier, uh, not earlier in this lecture, but um, early, I believe it is in your textbook, are best categorized as occupational deviants. When you think of a white collar criminal, to put it another way, you're thinking about a occupational deviant. Occupational deviants might be expected to commit de this crime uh, as part of their job. For example, certain professions have specific crimes that they worry about. There are jobs that are more prone to committing crimes than others, so thus we need to keep an eye on it as a society. Uh, medical professionals, there are uh, ways that you could break the law to benefit yourself. Things like unnecessary surgery, fraudulent payment claims, either uh, using the insurance company as your victim or the patient as your victim. Legal professionals could overcharge for fees and intentionally cause delays in court that would cause them to get paid more. Those are also occupational deviants. Accountants could assist clients in falsifying deductions during audits. audits. That also would be classified as a part of occupational deviance. And certainly, there have been many accountants that have been asked to lie on uh, a document uh, to, favor, to favor their client one way or another. And this is why, regardless of the individual uh, discipline or profession, um, it's if, you're, if you consider yourself an ethical person, it is very um, important to follow the codes of ethics of your, of your profession itself, right? There are rules that I have uh, about being a teacher. There are things I can do, the things I don't do, right? Because it, it would, it's not fair for me. It's not fair for students. It can cause very bad and ugly situations. So white collar crime committed by employees for individual gain is typically far less costly than crime committed by corporations. So in terms of white collar crime, uh, occupational deviance is lower on the ladder, but occupational deviance is more costly than street crime, right? So if you have access to a certain part of your corporation's uh, financial records, and you have the ability to draw money and then kind of run to Mexico, right? That is one kind of uh, damage that can be done, and you can get away with a certain amount of money. But if someone super high up in the corporation, or if the corporation itself decides to start stealing money from the uh, accounts it has access to, that obviously would be far more money. And both of those are far more than someone who robs a house and maybe gets away with $400 uh, would actually do. Uh, here are some more occupational deviance facts. It is estimated, estimated that as many as 60% of American employees may steal from their employers if the opportunity is presented. 
this statistic, I included it because I think it's kind of fishy, quite frankly. Uh, this says to me, that 60% says to me, that we're probably talking about things like stapler, stapler stealing or maybe a ream of paper or some tape or something like that. We're probably not looking at actual full-scale embezzling. Uh, embezzling then uh, costs as much as 200 and, uh, sorry, $27.2 billion uh, to the United States economy each year. And commercial banks lose five times more money to embezzlers than they do armed robbers, thus underlying that whole thing that bank robbery actually uh, is a, it, it's a, it's a chump crime. And uh, a di because society sees bank robbery as being so dangerous, you're almost guaranteed to get caught if you try to rob a bank. It's a really stupid crime to commit. Uh, financial fraud then, including both tax evasion and securities fraud, uh, even though it's not something that we pseudo glamorize or talk about or that you see on exciting TV, uh, financial fraud is actually quite common in our, our society and other societies like us. There are some similarities between occupational deviance and what we call blue collar crime. Blue collar crime be basically being that street crime that we think about um, mugging someone, stealing a car, that sort of thing. Uh, if the individual's greed is stronger than their fear of getting caught, then the person who is prone to do either white collar or blue collar crime is going to do the crime, right? That's a basic tenet of criminology. Uh, additionally, for either type of crime, if there is an opportunity to commit a crime, it is more likely to actually happen. That's called a crime of opportunity. Most crimes are crimes of opportunity committed by people that don't actually consider themselves like professional criminals, um, for what that's worth. And then law enforcement is lax on... Uh, or the individual is likely not to be prosecuted. Well, I, let me rephrase this bullet. The crime is more likely to occur if there aren't many cops watching the thing and the individual isn't going to get caught. Now, the thing here, the difference between blue collar and white collar crime is this would be why we would expect there to be more white collar crime, which there is because cops basically don't pay attention to it. And all of these factors tend to be greater when we consider white collar criminals and they tend to be uh, less uh, likely when we consider blue collar criminals. Really across the board, there's more opportunity to commit white collar crime in our society than blue collar crime. I would love to say that we have law enforcement set up then in a proportionate degree to try to stop white collar crime. The reality of the matter is very, very few officers or agents of any kind in any branch of the government are dedicated to stopping this type of crime. We just don't pay attention to it. Uh, here are some more concepts that are helpful to both uh, blue, understanding blue collar and white collar criminals. Uh, the first is social capital which is the cultural knowledge you use to ease social interactions. Social capital is used by everyone. Uh, it's not just used by criminals and non-criminals, but uh, it, is, it can be used by criminals toward the end of committing a crime. It's just, it's, it's an easy word for the stuff you know and the people you know. Criminal capital then is a specific type of social capital that takes the form of knowledge and skills surrounding what you need to commit a crime. How do you break into a house? How do you hotwire a car? How do you embezzle money out of your boss's bank account? Those are all examples of criminal capital. And then opportunity structure is a point in social structure that is ideal or not ideal for contributing to crime. If there is part of society that is prone for someone to steal from it, uh, then it is more likely to be the actual spot where people will steal from it. Uh, white collar criminals tend to have 
great access to large amounts of money and that's actually a major contributor to white collar crime especially among disgruntled workers okay that is it for this lecture uh if you have any questions just uh contact me